So John, I forgot that you went to Ohio State. When did you graduate? Uh, 2011. So Andrea and I worked in the same lab. That's, that's what she was helping. Yeah. John was my Ruth's giving me this weird error message. <laughs> How do I fix it? That's what I love to You graduated what year? 2013. Yeah, but I started with them the summer even before I started classes at grad school. Okay. So now she's actually uh, at Los Alamos National Laboratory. She is uh, a very prestigious fellow at Los Alamos, a Marie Curie fellow, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so that's a very highly sought after position uh, in the postdoc world. Um, so now she's doing a bunch of cool stuff at Los Alamos, uh, on Fermi, as well as Hawk, and she'll tell us about uh, how they can be used to probe uh, dark matter. Take care. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation. I actually did my undergraduate at Rice, so this is not an unfamiliar okay. part of the country for me. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's get started. I'm going to talk about how we can probe uh, various dark matter uh, models using gamma rays. So first I'll just give a little bit of background for those who maybe aren't so familiar. I'll talk about the two instruments that I'm involved in, and then we'll go over you know, some of the results. I can't go over all of them. Um, so if you're really interested in a specific one that I don't get to, let me know. Um, and also, please feel free to ask questions as we go. If anything's not clear, just type one out. All right, so this is just your one slide dark matter primer. Um, there are sort of, from the observational evidence that we have for dark matter, there's a couple of things that we can kind of tell about it. So one of the observational things we have is the rotation curves in spiral galaxies, where the stars in the outskirts of the spiral galaxy are going way too fast to be gravitationally bound by the visible matter alone, therefore saying, well, there's got to be something else holding this thing together. And so that's telling us that dark matter clumps in large halos around galaxies, and then actually you can see that they, like, there's different size of halos. So you can have even bigger halos that galaxy clusters form in. And then even within our own galaxy, you can have this substructure. Um, the can be dwarf galaxies, which we'll talk about later. And so this actually, this sort of, sort of evidence first came about in the 1930s. Fritz Vicky really just took the burial theorem, which if you're a grad student in physics, you solve the burial theorem over and over again. Just took that with the coma cluster, and it's the same kind of argument where you look at the velocities of the objects in the system that you know is gravitationally bound, and you realize that the velocity is way too high to be gravitationally bound by the visible matter alone. So then we get this uh, bullet cluster, very famous, dark matter um, observation where you have two galaxy clusters merging in the plane of the sky, so very geometrically favorable. And what you saw in this object is a separation of the dark matter that's making up most of the mass and the normal baryonic matter that shines bright in x-rays. So the green contours show you where all the mass is, these uh, bright spots here show you where the x-rays are, and there's a clear separation. So that's telling you that the dark matter went on through and barely interacted. So the normal matter starts interacting electromagnetically mostly and makes these x-rays. So we know that the dark matter is virtually collisionless. And then we also have, this one is a bit harder to have an intuition for, but you can look at the, um, 
the cold spots in the cosmic microwave background imprint, and then look at the large scale structure in the universe today. And in order to understand the, um, the large scale structure that's formed, given these initial conditions from the CMB, we need to have dark matter. And the dark matter actually needs to not act like protons, and not act like baryons. So that's telling us that we think the dark matter is not baryonic. And that's actually, I think, very interesting because that's telling us that it's probably not anything described by our standard model of particle physics. It's something really new. And so that's exciting. You have to look over something new. So just to go to the first point, um, whenever I give like an outreach, I will say that dark matter is the gravitational blue that holds galaxies together. And there's actually this game called Universe Sandbox 2 where I took a spiral galaxy and removed the dark matter, and that's what happened. So if there was no dark matter in the Milky Way, our galaxy would literally fall apart, except for this teeny tiny little core in the middle. So kind of important. So the other thing, the other point I want to make as far as we're talking about motivation for dark matter is that the evidence for it exists on many, many different length scales. And I'll also mention that all of our observational evidence for dark matter comes from space. So those rotation curves, the bullet cluster, the CMB, this large scale structure, and you know, that's, that's all from space. And so you look at the large scale structure of the universe, you get this sort of web-like filament structure where kind of at the nodes here you get galaxy clusters, and then within those nodes you get galaxies, within those galaxies you get the subclustering. Um, but yeah, so the evidence for, for dark matter is just overwhelming. Every like scale you can expect on the universe, really nothing makes sense without it. So it's a worthwhile thing to try to understand more. So when we talk about dark matter, um, back in the 90s, there was a lot of people looking for things called machos, massive compact object, or massive compact halo objects. So these would be um, baryonic matter, but dim, maybe like a black hole or dim neutron star. And they didn't really see many. So nowadays, people tend to talk about what if the dark matter is a particle, so like a proton. And there's a lot of different options for the particles. So this is from a recent review where you have the mass of your dark matter candidate as a function of its interaction cross-section. And you can see this is going over many, many orders of magnitude. People tend to focus on this green box. This is a neutralino or a WIMP. And I'm gonna show some motivation as to why that's so exciting. But we're not seeing this. We're not seeing this at the LHC. We're not seeing this in the underground detectors like LUX or Super C or CDMS. So I'm actually really excited to see the theory community think outside of this little wind box and explore more of these other options. Uh, I also like how creative they get with the names. For example, this is called Wimzilla, because they're very happy. <laughs> Go figure. And so I will point out and highlight this guy called the Axion. There's going to be a colloquium on this at 4. I recommend that you go to. We can probe axions and axion-like particles with gamma rays. I have backup slides about that. If you're interested in, in knowing about it, just ask me. Um, okay. Oh, the other thing that I want to mention about dark matter, and I guess I'll mention this on the other slide, is that when we talk about it being a particle, since it needs to form these kind of gravitational like pockets, halos that galaxies form in, it should be cold, so non-relativistic. If it's whipping around too fast, it's not going to collect, collect into these halos. Uh, and we also it has to be stable. So it can't decay too quickly because it has to stick around for these galaxies to form in their halos. All right, so why are the WIMPs so exciting? WIMPs are exciting because of something called the WIMP miracle. So WIMP stands for Weakly Interacting Massive Particle. If you assume that the WIMP was in thermal equilibrium in the early universe, that just means it was being created and then annihilating at equal rates. So eventually the universe cools, and so the creation piece turns off, becomes Boltzmann suppressed. And then also now the universe is expanding, so eventually the WIMPs get so far away from each other they never run into each other to annihilate, so the annihilation turns off. And when those two things turn off, now your number density of dark matter is, is frozen, basically. It's fixed. And that's what's shown in this plot. So this is the number density as a function of time. And you can see that it's going to be decreasing. So the creation turns off. You annihilate only for a little bit. So you lose some number density. But then you turn off and freeze out at a certain time. And what's amazing is if you just simply assume about 100 GPV in mass, and you put in a uh, cross-section that's around the strength of the weak interaction in the early universe, then you get a prediction that the total amount of dark matter today should be something like 26%, which is exactly what we see based on observations of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And so this is often called the Witt miracle, and at least to me as an experimentalist, that motivates this as a hypothesis worth testing. Now, what's interesting, so if you go and you think beyond WIMPs, 
Uh, an example of something that's coming out of the theoretical community that's quite interesting, for really heavy dark masses, dark matter masses, so about above a TeV, you can get this thing called Sommerfeld enhancement, where you, uh, I know this is a teeny tiny Feynman diagram, but you have the dark matter sort of having this attractive force with the WZs, and then that is going to enhance the cross-section for the dark matter annihilation at slow velocities. So there, and now, remember, dark matter today is non-relativistic. That's how it forms the halos. Early universe, it wasn't. So you can have it so that at the early universe, you had this lower cross-section that gives you the Wint miracle. But now today, things are moving slower, so you could get these enhancements to the cross-section. And so you can see, depending on what the mass of the dark matter is, we might get lucky and have a higher cross-section. Higher cross-section means more interaction, means easier to detect. So this is interesting, and I'm actually really excited to see what comes out of the theory community in terms of heavy wimps or even things that are up in 100 TeV or a PeV even in mass. All right, so what does dark matter have to do with gamma rays? So dark matter, we assume it interacts through some unknown mechanism. This is where the theorists play. And it annihilates two standard models. So we know how to detect standard model particles. And so if it's decaying to, say, a pair of quarks, since, uh, so say this is dark matter annihilating the galactic center, that's um, eight kiloparsecs away. Kiloparsec is roughly 4,000 light years, so you know, 30,000 light years away. Um, we're never going to actually see the initial products. Right, so these are two B quarks, those B quarks are going to decay into something. They're going to make these jets. So then, so what we're going to see are these secondary, like daughter particles, so to speak. And from these different, depending on what your initial state uh, annihilation products were, you get a variety of different guys out here. Some of those are gamma rays, but you can also get neutrinos and other things like electrons, positrons, protons. And neutrinos and gamma rays are special because they're neutral. So when they're moving way, way, way through the universe, through all these magnetic fields, they don't get deflected. Protons, electrons, they get deflected. Gamma rays are gonna point back to exactly where they came from, same with neutrinos. And so what that means is we can say, well, I know there's a lot of dark matter over there. Am I seeing gamma rays from that direction as well? I mean, the dark matter analyses are really, you can boil it down to that, that simple of a thing. Uh, we are entering the era of neutrino astronomy, which is exciting. We're starting to see neutrinos that are not coming from our atmosphere or from the sun. But we're seeing very few of them. We have a, a couple more gamma rays. So the gamma ray side of this tends to be a, you know, we have a little bit more data. But I'm excited for the neutrinos to catch up. All right, so we're gonna look for these gamma rays from pieces, from places where we know there's dark matter. So let's talk about the instruments. When you talk about the current gamma ray instruments, you can classify them in sort of two broad categories, this top three are examples of something called an air Cherenkov telescope. So the gamma ray hits our atmosphere, makes a shower, and that shower of energy particles makes a very faint flash of blue light, which is what's being captured by these telescopes. It's called Cherenkov radiation. So these guys can only operate at night, and they also are, have a very small field of view, but they can zoom in really deep. So these are for focused, deep observations. And then we have the two on the bottom, which is the ones I'm gonna focus on, are complementary to the ACTs. These are what I'm gonna call the wide field of view instruments. So this is something called Hawk and Fermi. Uh, they both can see about 20% of the sky at any given time. They're both always on and taking data. The big difference is Fermi, it's in space, and its peak sensitivity is for gamma ray energies of about a GeV, and Hawk's peak sensitivity is for gamma rays around the TeV, so that's a factor of the value higher. So between the two of these guys, you're covering seven decades of energy of these gamma rays. All right. So let's talk about the Fermi lab. Uh, here's a schematic. So the way the Fermi lab works is the gamma ray has to turn into an electron positron pair for us to see anything. And so it's going to do that in this tracker subsystem. The tracker has inter, or it has a silicon layer, then a tungsten layer, then silicon, then tungsten. Tungsten's a high Z material that gets that gamma ray to pair convert. Once a pair converts, we can figure out where it came from using the tracker, and then we can figure out how much energy it has using the calorimeter. We can also use the calorimeter to get directional information as well. And there is some energy loss in the tracker, which we need to account for in the reconstruction. Now, the other subsystem is our ACD, or anti-coincidence detector. The idea here is that a gamma ray does not leave 
a signal in the ACD and a charged particle like a proton will. And so actually in space, depending on the energy, the number of protons hitting our detector at these energies at any given time is something like a thousand to one. So a thousand protons for every one gamma ray, or worse. So the point is that we need to have very, very good gamma hadron separation. And the ACD for Fermi is a big heavy lifter for that. And something cool about this ACD that was better than our uh, predecessor, Egret, it's tiled. Egret just had one big monolithic ACD, and we're gonna see in this example that that causes self peeling all right, so for me, I will say that all of our data is public. So if you're interested in studying GEV gamma rays, um, talk to Louie. He'll tell you how you can get the data and analyze it. We have software for everyone to analyze it as well. So please help. And the collaboration, there is a collaboration that sort of maintains the instrument, does analysis with the instrument. Um, there's about 400 of us, uh, which I'm a member of. All right, so let's look at a gamma ray in Fermi. So this is a simulation. So we know exactly where this gamma ray came from. It's 27 GeV, so a somewhat energetic event. So it's coming on in. This is a very deeply penetrating gamma ray. You'll notice you don't see anything because the gamma ray hasn't pair converted. Once the gamma ray pair converts, this thing lights up like a Christmas tree. And you start getting all of these hits in this tracker. Now when the, when the electron-positron pair hit the dense calorimeter, we get something called backsplash, where we get this spew of crap coming off of the calorimeter. And so this is where if we had egret and we didn't have a tiled ACD, we would have this stuff go off and hit that anti-coincidence detector. And then we say, oh, there's something in the anti-coincidence detector, it's not a gamma ray, throw that event out. But what you can see here is there's a clear separation from the gamma ray track and the backsplash track. So since you can do a rudimentary calculation on board actually, where you say, what do we think the gamma ray direction is? Were there any tiles in that direction hit? No? Okay, let's keep this event. And then another cool thing is you can see in this calorimeter, I know this is a 2D view, but we do have 3D imaging in the calorimeter. And for an event like this, this high energy and deeply penetrating, we would use the calorimeter shower to help give us an idea of the direction. You can see that centroid kind of lines up exactly as you'd expect. All right, so this is what a 27 GeV event looks like. Here's a 1 TeV event. So now we're starting to get saturated. This would be a super hard event to reconstruct. Uh, we're losing a lot of the shower, you know, it's probably coming out here and just not being captured. Fermi just isn't big enough. And so we can't, we are pushing to try to go this high in energy, um, but then we start to run out of events. There just aren't as many photons out there. So what do we do? Well, we, we build a bigger detector. So the bigger detector that can get up to a TEV is Hawk. Hawk is a high altitude Water Trend Cop Observatory. It's in uh, mountains of Mexico near Puebla. Uh, it's right near Pico de Orizaba, which I think is the highest mountain in Mexico. So it's up at 14,000 feet or 4,100 meters. It's 300 tanks of water. Each tank is five meters. So that's roughly about the height of a, um, a T-Rex. If you can remember the bones when you went to the museum as a kid. Uh, they're, they're quite big tanks. <laughs> Here's a little person. Right. <laughs> so the way this works is, um, so now we're actually using the whole atmosphere as our conversion material. So the gamma ray comes into the atmosphere, and thankfully gamma rays at this high of an energy get stopped uh, because this high of energy gamma rays plus human body is not so great. So the gamma ray comes in, it hits the atmosphere, it makes this shower of particles as the uh, atmosphere kind of stops it, slows it down. And then that shower of particles is what's being detected by Hawk. So within each of these, we fill these tanks with water. And so when the uh, super relativistic particles travel faster than the speed of light in water, they emit Trankov radiation, that flash of blue light. But all of these tanks are sealed, so it's completely dark inside the tank. So that little dim flash of blue light from the particle is detected by, one, by four uh, photomultiplier tubes, photosensors. And then you can figure out which tanks saw what, and you can reconstruct where the gamma ray came from and how much energy it has. And down here, and I'll talk about this a little bit. So now, something that I really, really wish Hawk had, that Fermi has, is that, is that ACD. So with Hawk, we don't have an anti-coincidence detector. I, I, I don't know how you would do that. Maybe you could have like floating tiles in the atmosphere, um, but it, it's not as odd since Hawk is 
such a different instrument. It's not as obvious how to do that. So the gamma hadron separation is quite difficult. Uh, what you can do is the electromagnetic showers tend to be more centrally um, cored. And so when you look, so this is, this one actually might be more like a hadronic shower because in a hadronic shower you have these things called muons. Muons um, are really long lived so they make these long straight tracks and they spew out all over the central part of the shower. So what the muons are going to do is they're going to leave little speckles around the edges away from the center of the core of the shower. So this is what a gamma ray shower looks like. It's nice and centrally cored, but a cosmic ray or a proton shower is going to have these speckles from those muons. And so this is really one of the ways that we can tell the difference. Another way is the protons, if you plotted the distribution of the protons over the sky, they're isotropic. So there's an equal number of protons coming from any direction of the sky. This is because the proton gets scrambled by the magnetic fields on their way to Earth. Gamma rays point back to where they came from. So if there's a point in the sky where you know there's a gamma ray source, you actually see in Hawk an increase in your total data rate because there's that huge proton background but then a tiny excess of gamma rays. So you can also use the uh, spatial information to separate gammas from, from hadrons. All right, so this is just a, a cartoon of how our detector works. And actually this is the simulation. This was a pretty big event, so 60 TeV. And this is slowed way down, so you can see how the timing information is used in the event reconstruction. So for this guy, you see it sweep the air shower front sweeping across the array. There's the core. So it kind of like came from that direction. You know, the computer algorithm does a much better job. And then you can calculate how much charge was deposited in each of these photomultiplier tubes, and then use that to reconstruct the energy. And so you just do that over and over again. You say, for each gamma ray event, where did it came from? What's its energy? It's very similar to what we do in Fermi. And you keep a record of that, then you can make a big map. All right, so how do we compare the sensitivity of these instruments? This is one way to do it. This is something called the, uh, this is a differential sensitivity. So let me tell you about how to read this plot in case you're not familiar. What these lines are showing is the, so on the y-axis here, you can interpret this as a flux or a brightness of your source at different gamma ray energies. So on the y-axis, going up is brighter. These lines are showing you what flux level each instrument would find in what we call a five sigma detection at that energy. So five sigma we consider to be a discovery of a source. And so what that means is sources that are above these lines, that are brighter than that threshold, we can see them. Things below this line, they're too dim. Or they would take longer time integration for us to be able to see them. So you'll notice that on this, when we're looking at, like, say, Hawk versus Hessen Veritas, those Eric Trenkoff telescopes, the times are way different. And so you might ask yourself, well, why? And actually, I think these times are pretty fair. So you, the thing you have to remember with the ACTs is they have a very small field of view, and they only operate at night. So really, on one source, 50 hours over a year is a lot of time that they would dedicate to that. Whereas with Hawk, always on, there's no pointing. We see two-thirds of the sky every day. It's a survey instrument, so it's a different kind of thing. So that's why we compare kind of one year of Hawk with 50 hours of these air Cherenkov. Fermi's the same sort of thing. It's a, it's a survey instrument. So here we'll look at the five-year of Fermi versus the five-year of Hawk. Uh, that's pretty fair. And something, I worked it out. So right, Hawk is seeing two-thirds of the sky, and they're getting, so for an air Cherenkov telescope to get exactly the same amount of exposure, so one year, on two thirds of the sky, every single point in the sky, it would take 150 years for the Air Trenkov telescopes to do that. Because they'd have to point and stare for 50 hours at each spot in the sky, tiled, to get the whole thing. And so, anyway, it's just, that just was a point to show how complementary these things are. Hawk doesn't go as deep as quickly as the Air Trenkov telescopes do, but we see the whole sky. So you can use Hawk to inform where you should look with the Air Trenkov telescopes and vice versa. So they're really complementary instruments. I think it's important to have both. Board. Okay, so let's talk about the data and let's bring it back to dark matter. But let's first, we're going to first talk about the data. This is what the gamma ray sky looks like as seen uh, with the Fermi telescope. So this is at about a GeV in energy. And this is a seven year map. Fermi was launched in 2008. So it's been going for a while. Um, 
And this is for uh, energies above GeV. All right, so let's talk about this map. Uh, you can start to uh, notice some objects. You see these point sources, so these little specks of light. They just get smeared out because the spatial precision of the instrument isn't perfect. If it was perfect, these would be you know, infinitesimally small points, small point sources. But then you also see this fuzzy stuff, call that diffuse emission. This is from high energy particles in our galaxy interacting with dust and gas in our galaxy, and they make gamma rays. So you can actually look at the gamma ray map versus, say, a 21 centimeter line map. The 21 centimeter line map shows where all the hydrogen is, and then you start to see a correlation, and you say, okay, well, that's because things are running into these hydrogen atoms, make, say, pions. Pions decay make gamma rays. Uh, we also have, so in this plot, this is in galactic coordinates. So the center here is the galactic center. This is our galactic plane. Things off of the galactic planes, this Milky Way is kind of pancakey. Uh, these tend to be extra galactic sources. The stuff in the plane tend to be galactic sources. And I point out a couple of them. Here's Gamenga, it's a pulsar. Here's the crab, also a pulsar. And I put down here, this is from the Aquarius simulation. This is what we would expect the gamma ray sky to look like if there was only dark matter. So we expect there to be a whole bunch of dark matter in our galactic center. So we expect the density of dark matter to increase as we go towards the galactic center. It's hard to see, but there are some speckles here because there are those substructure, little overdensities like dwarf galaxies. And so the point that I like to make with this is neither of these look anything alike. So what that's telling you is that our gamma ray sky is not dark matter dominated. Dark matter is just a small piece. And so that's where the challenge is going to be when we go looking for dark matter. We're going to have to understand all of this other stuff in order to subtract it and see if there's anything left over. So this is the sky at a GEV. I'll just remind you of a couple of our benchmarks. So remember the plane, Mercury 501, and Gamenga. So now we're going to go up to a TEV. So this is the one-year sky map from Hawk. I'm oh, sorry, 1.4 year. So Hawk has not been running as long as Bernie. Something to keep in mind. And let's flip back and forth between these guys because they look a lot. They look very different. So remember that Hawk is looking at gamma rays produced a thousand times more energetic uh, than, than Fermi. So about right away, you can kind of see the diffuse emission is not as prominent. In fact, it's really hard to see this there at all. A lot of these extra galactic sources aren't there, or we haven't seen them yet. But then that's telling you something. If they're making a lot of uh, gamma rays at GEV, then there's a cutoff. So and then that's telling you about the um, mechanisms that are accelerating particles in those sources and what their limitations are. So that's a, but then there's some sources that don't turn off, right? Clearly we're seeing a, bu a bunch of uh, galactic sources. We still very clearly see the crab. It's very nearby, uh, known gamma ray source. And it's hard to tell, so I'm gonna do a zoom in, but we look at Gaminga here, I really like this. Here it's a point source, but here with Hawk, it's this fuzzy blob. So if we zoom in on the fuzzy blob, what's cool is with Fermi at a GEV, you're seeing the pulsar right in the middle. But at a TEV, what you're seeing is the pulsar wind nebula from around the object. And so what's tell what that's telling you is there's for these higher energy particles are being accelerated, not like right in the pulsar, but they're being accelerated in the cloud around it. So I think that's cool. The other cool thing with Gaminga, when we were looking about this with Hawk, we found another hot spot nearby, near a, another pulsar wind nebula called Monogem. And so unofficially within the collaboration, there's sort of two teams of calling this BFF, or my favorite is Gamigo. So we'll see what we end up calling it officially. It'll probably have some boring name like Hawk 2 or whatever its RA deck is. The other source that I've highlighted here is Markarian 501. This is a known, a known active galactic nuclei, and I'm just showing it uh, day by day so that you can see that it does have some time variability. So we make these plots, you know, we add all the gamma rays up over 1.4 years, but just wanted to remind you there is a time domain that has some really cool physics. And so this is a giant black hole with a big jet pointing right at us and it flares. And understanding the physics behind that is super cool. It's something I'm not going to talk about. Okay, so you might be asking, what's with the holes? Fermi didn't have holes. What's going on there? Well, the thing is, Hawk is not in space. We are stuck on Earth. So when we go and we plot the Hawk map in equatorial coordinates, so instead of being centered on the galaxy, now we're centered on the Earth, it becomes much clearer where the holes come from. So Hawk here is on Earth, and so we are at about 20 degrees latitude. 
So the field of view is something like 60 to negative 20 degrees in latitude. And so if you plotted this in equatorial coordinates, you know, this is about negative 20 to 60. And so that's where those ones come from. And then also when we plot it in equatorial coordinates, we can stick on the constellations that everyone is familiar with. So you can sort of understand if our eyes were, instead of seeing visible photons, we saw 10 billion times more energetic TEV photons. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't see Orion, but we'd see the crab. We'd see this fuzzy blob Gaminga, these two Markarians, and then we'd see this bright plane. And so here with Sagittarius, that's where the galactic center is. You can see that the galactic center is just at the edge of Hawk's field of view. Uh, we're going to try really, really hard to get what we can out of the galactic center. Uh, that's going to be a challenging analysis for Hawk. So here we are again in equatorial coordinates, but now the white circles are dark matter targets. So these are regions of the sky where we know there's a big concentration of dark matter. And so these are regions where we look for gamma ray excesses. So one of those is M31, it's the Andromeda galaxy. We've got Virgo, it's a galaxy cluster. We've got a whole bunch of these dwarf galaxies speckled around, Draco, Coma, and then we have the galactic center. Those are kind of our big targets. All right, so let's talk about dark matter searches. So when you're talking about these different targets, not, all, not every target is equal. Not every target is going to be expected to have the same brightness from a gamma ray signal from dark matter. And so a parameter that's super important is called the J factor. The J factor is for dark matter annihilation. It's an integral along the line of sight of the dark matter density squared, because it's annihilation, two particles. And the J factor intrinsically includes the distance. So right, if you had an object and you moved it away, your, your flux is going to decrease like 1 over d squared. And so that 1 over d squared is just inherently in the J factor. So the J factor has the total amount of dark matter plus the distance. So things with lots of dark matter that are close by are going to give us the brightest gamma ray signal if there is dark matter annihilation. So a larger J factor is better. And here we're plotting the J factor for several of the dwarf galaxies known in the Milky Way as a function of their distance. And so like I was saying, you can see clearly as you get further away, your J factor gets less. You expect that to be a different dark matter. But we can go and we can look at what are the different J factors for some different targets. So this is a table from a recent review. If you're interested in learning about all of the details of the recent Fermi analyses, I recommend reading this paper. Uh, it's, it's a really great one. So here we have the galactic center. Now the J factor for the galactic center has huge uncertainties on it because we don't know how quickly the density of dark matter increases towards the center. And so that's what's causing you know, these orders of magnitude variation. But you can see it's the largest one, and that's just because it's a big clump of dark matter that's nearby. Then we have some Milky Way satellites. Those are dwarf galaxies. You know, those tend to be a couple orders of magnitude dimmer. We have galaxy clusters. So galaxy clusters you know, may be similar to some of the mid-level dwarfs. And then another thing that I wanted to point out, besides this J factor, is the angular ascent. So a, um, a feature of Hawk that's amazing is its wide field of view. So for the Air Trinkoff telescopes, remember I was saying the gamma hadron separation is hard. So you can do this um, on off, where you try to look on for an excess near gamma ray source, and then you can get your background from sort of this off analysis. But if you have a really small field of view, and your object is very extended, then the whole thing is in your field of view, and you're going to do an on off, you're just going to subtract out your, your target. Whereas with Hawk, since it has this wide field of view, we are more sensitive to extended objects than the Air telescopes. And actually that's why so no one had seen Domingo or BFF before in TV gamma rays, because that's an extended object. So when we start to talk about you know, the galactic center, which is really extended, galaxy clusters, which is really extended, M31 and Andromeda galaxy, really extended, this is where you want to be looking for dark matter using Hawk or Fermi, these wide field of view instruments. Okay. So speaking of extended targets, um, what do they look like in terms of their dark matter? So you kind of have to model it. Um, you can sort of map out what you think the dark matter distribution looks like by looking at the kinetics of the stars in the different galaxies. So, you know, they're moving really fast out here. You can map out how much dark matter you need to hold the whole thing together. And so this is an example of the dark matter distribution for M31 in a specific model. And so you can see there's this smooth component, but on top of that we do get these little clumps called that substructure. 
And these clumps sort of correspond to like these uh, dwarf galaxies, for example. And so you integrate all of that, and that gets you your total J factor. All right, so for M31, we've looked at that with Hawk, and we didn't see an excess of gamma rays, and so we're able to set limits. So the limits that we set are in this cross-section mass plane, so anything above the line has been excluded. So if the cross-section were higher than the limit, we would have seen it, because it would have been producing gamma rays we were uh, sensitive to. And so here I'm just going to also put the limits from Virgo, another extended target. This one was about 3 degrees. From Fermi, and so here we can get up to like a TEV, say in the BB bar channel. So the channels here, these are just those first annihilation products from the dark matter annihilation. And then those go on and make a bunch of other things, including gamma rays. So you look at the BB bar channel, we're getting up to like 10 to the 22. So here's a TEV. We're getting up to 10 to the 22. So the Fermi limits will keep going like that. And so the Fermi limits start to run out of steam, and that's where the Hawk limits come in. So these things are really complementary, is my point. And so the Hawk limits, this is from Virgo and from M31, are these two blue lines. And these shaded things that are really, really hard to see are, depending on the exact dark matter model you use for the halo, we might actually expect there to be some signal here. So we kind of call this our sensitivity reach. And so plotting here, this is for the WW channel. And in that channel, you do expect to have the Sommerfeld enhancement. So you can see that the Hawk limits are starting to hit cross-sections that we might think are possible for Sommerfeld enhancement. Um, but like I said, this is just the first year limits. These are going to get better with more time. More, more time integration, but also detector upgrades, which I'll talk about, and better understanding of the detector and analysis upgrades. Yeah. So given that Fermi has a signal from M31, astrophysical signal from M31, yeah. is this surprising that Hawk didn't see anything, or there's complications? Well, so, because if Hawk didn't see anything, then that's going to tell you that if it's astrophysical, there's some cutoff. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, I don't think it's surprising. Okay. But the fact that Fermi, yeah, Fermi does see M31. And okay. I'm currently working on a joint Fermi Hawk M31 analysis. Okay. But, um, but the one in the last side, now you have to worry about uh, another background and the degeneracies of that. Right. Whereas with Hawk, you can, it's a bit easier because you can just say, is there a gamma ray source there? Right, so then it's like two things. Is there a gamma ray source there? And then your second question is, can you convince yourself it's dark matter? So a lot of the times you can get to number one, but the second one's a lot harder. Can you also run is the Fermi, is the Fermi 31 source extended or not? Uh, a little bit of a so I will give the results from the published paper okay. because yeah. uh, yeah. there's one in publication. But from the published paper, there was some slight significant or slightly significant evidence for extension, yeah. maybe around the two three signal level, but not like very extended. Yeah. The J factors that you mentioned, uh, places where it's very, it's high, but the background for uh, the J factor is only the signal. Right? Correct. That's right. Yeah. Good point. So right in the galactic center, your background's also. Here which we're going to see makes it complicated. No, that's a really good point. OK, so from the um, extended targets like Virgo and F31, uh, with Hawk, we've also calculated lifetime limits. So instead of dark matter annihilation, you can have dark matter decay. Now, you'll notice that all of these lifetime limits are much, much, much larger than the age of the universe. So we're still in the condition where dark matter is basically stable. But we have such a big clump of it even if the decay was super rare, we would expect to see some gamma rays from that object. And what's interesting about the decay limits is we are seeing these PEV neutrinos, like Bert and Ernie, from Ice Cube. And some people have interpreted, we'll say those neutrinos came from dark matter decay. This would have to be very heavy dark matter, about a PEV, and they typically tend to have lifetimes around 1 times 10 to the 27 seconds, which we go up, so this is 100 TeV. So a PEV, one more decade, we can stretch to that, and we're already about 10 to the 27. So Hawk's going to have sensitivity to test these models, which is really exciting. Because that's the thing, with dark matter, if dark matter is a fundamental particle, then its mass and its cross-section and its lifetime have to be the same everywhere. Right? It's like measuring the mass of the proton in the galactic center has to be the same as in the Virgo ga galaxy. It's a fundamental property. So dark matter searches in astrophysics can be really hard, but something that we can uh, use to anchor ourselves is that we should see the same thing everywhere. And so if we want to say these things from neutrinos from Ice Cube are dark matter, then we have to be able to see the gamma rays as well. 
And if we don't, then that's evidence that it's not dark matter. But I, I like that. All right, I'm going to try to speed up because we've got to get through the Galactic Center. So you might have heard of the GEV excess and the Fermi data in the Galactic Center. This has been around since 2009. Um, the short version, here's our data. If we try to subtract all of the known non-dark matter astrophysical stuff from this map, there's still a spot left in the Galactic Center. And many, many, many people have studied this. And I think this is great, because this is the Fermi data is public, so we get a lot of great minds working on this project. And they all kind of are seeing similar things. It seems to be spatially extended, and it seems to have a spectrum that peaks around one GEV. Now you can fit the spectrum with dark matter, but the question is now, is it dark matter or is it something else? And so I'm gonna tell you guys a little, some preliminary results from a, a analysis that I helped work on. And so if you wanna look at what other people have done, I'm happy to talk afterwards, and I point you to this plethora of preferences. So the thing I point out about the Galactic Center is in space, the photons don't tell us how far away they came from. So when we look towards the galactic center, we're seeing all the photons created between us and the edge of the universe along this line of sight. And at a GeV, about 85% of the photons that we see between one and 100 GeV along this line of sight don't come from right in the middle. They come from the foreground or the background. 85%, that's the vast majority. So we need to model the foreground and the background really well to isolate just what's going on in here. And then when we get down there, most of that 15% is going to be from high energy particles whacking around all the dust and gas in the center of this galaxy. So the point is that the dark matter piece along this line of sight is a super small component of a background, and you really need to understand your background. And the point I'm gonna make in this is that I say we're gonna need to understand the background model to the few percent level in order to say anything about dark matter. So, like I said, we've entered the era of precision gamma ray astronomy. So, okay, we have this excess in the galactic center. So something we did in this work is we said, well, let's take all of the different pieces of the foreground background modeling and the modeling right in the middle of the galaxy that's not dark matter. Let's turn all those knobs within their uncertainties and let's see how that changes the excess that we see. So I'm not gonna go through all the knobs we twiddled, um, but it did change the spectrum significantly. The one now I'm going to talk about that I think is interesting. If you've been paying attention to gamma ray astronomy, you might have heard of something called the Fermi bubbles. These are these big lobes of emission that seem to be centered right on our galaxy. But everyone's only ever modeled these lobes above 10 degrees. So we included a data-driven model of the bubbles that go to lower latitudes right into the middle. And when we include that in our model, this is the blue is the spectrum with, without the bubbles. The green is the spectrum with the bubbles. When we include the bubbles, it sort of takes out this high energy tail of the excess. Which is interesting because this high energy tail, if you're going to say that this is from 50 GeV dark matter, then any photon above 50 GeV cannot be from dark matter. Because the dark matter is non relativistic So the total energy in that annihilation is just the mass energy. So I think that's interesting. All right, so we wiggle all these knobs. The shading of this blue shows how the spectrum varied. So the point was, what something we were trying to do is we were like, can we, tw can we turn the knobs enough that we just completely get rid of this excess? And the answer is no. We could never get rid of the excess, which is super interesting. However, we can see that the spectrum varied quite a bit. And people have tried to use spectral arguments to tell the difference between dark matter and not dark matter, especially at this low end. But something we're saying in this paper is that the uncertainties are really large right now. And we really need to beat down these uncertainties before we can start making spectral arguments to distinguish. All right, so let's say you want to interpret this as dark matter. Well, what do we know about dark matter? Dark matter is supposed to be peaking in the galactic center and not peaking anywhere else in the sky, besides maybe a dwarf galaxy, but not nowhere else along the galactic plane. And I show these maps here. These are residual maps of the whole gamma ray sky when we subtract everything except for dark matter. And that's the bottom one here. And there is this bright spot in the galactic center, but the point I always like to make is there are spots everywhere. Uh, the data is better than the models, so the Fermi data is so awesome, it's forcing people to make the models better. That's science. And so something that we did in this analysis is we said, okay, we're only going to really think there's compelling evidence that this thing in the galactic center is dark matter if it's different than the other spots where we don't expect the dark matter to be a large signal. So we're doing a, a control region study where we don't expect to see signal. Now this is the size of the signal we see for different dark matter masses 
in the galactic center is something around the 5.5% level, percentage of the effective background. This is all of the dark matter fits we got elsewhere in the sky, where we don't expect to see dark matter. And we kind of take the 68% containment as the average. That's this purple line here, and that's about 5.5%. So the point is that what we're seeing in the galactic center looks a lot like what we're seeing elsewhere in the sky where we don't expect to see dark matter. Therefore, at this time, we can't claim that what we're seeing in the galactic center is dark matter. But we also can't say it isn't dark matter. It's just that the uncertainties in our modeling are too high right now. And like I said, we've entered the era of precision gamma ray astronomy. We need to get down to the few percent level in order to really say if what we're seeing in the galactic center is dark matter or not, using the galactic center data. So remember, I told you, if dark matter is a fundamental particle, its fundamental particle properties have to be the same everywhere. So we know there are other places with dark matter. So let's see if we see this signal we're seeing in the galactic center elsewhere. And that elsewhere is going to be the dwarf galaxies. So these are little over densities of dark matter. And these actually tend to be in pretty uh, quiet regions of the sky. So we're not staring down this bright beam like we are in the galactic center. We're off the plane where things are quieter. So the, the background uncertainties for the dwarf galaxies are much easier, much lower. The thing with the dwarf galaxies, though, is they're smaller, so the expected dark matter signal there is a little bit is less. But the cool thing, each individual dwarf galaxy can't stand up to the galactic center, but if you combine them, they do. And since, like I said, dark matter has to be the same everywhere, that's why we want to do this joint analysis with all of these targets, weighted based on their dark matter content. And the other cool thing about dwarfs is that inside them, there's really nothing making gamma rays. There's no like, star formation, there's no high energy particles being accelerated, there's no gas and stuff for them to interact with. So if we saw a dark matter signal from these guys, that would be pretty compelling evidence for dark matter. All right, so we've done this, we've looked for this. We have 15 dwarfs that are kind of very well studied these days, and we didn't see an excess coming from them. So we set limits using the Fermi data. And this dashed line here is the thermal relic this is that Wint Miracle cross section. So, models along this dashed line over here were really compelling models before these limits. But now these limits are telling us that nature is not giving us this as our dark matter. So, it sucks that we aren't detecting dark matter, but we're starting to probe those amazing hypotheses that we've had forever from the Wint Miracle. And I think that's a huge triumph. And so, the dwarfs, these are the dwarf limits from Fermi. We also can do a stacked dwarf analysis using Hawk. So another cool thing about these wide field of view survey instruments, these dwarfs are scattered all over the sky. And so, but we're a survey instrument. We see most of the sky every day. And so we're already observing all of these targets with you know, pretty similar exposure all the time. So it makes a stacked analysis very easy. And we don't have to make dedicated choices to stare at one object and not stare at another. We're just always staring at all of them. And so here are the limits from Hawk in the cross-section mass plane for various channels. The dashed line here are the limits from Fermi. So again, you can see that how complementary or how complementary both experiments are. And if we go over here in the WW channel, you can see that the Hawk limits were starting to push down into this region where you might expect to see a signal if there's summer felt enhancement. So. All right, let's go back to the Fermi limits. If we want to interpret the galactic center signal as dark matter, these contours are what the mass and the cross-section would have to be. This is what people have claimed it as a signal have been saying. Now what's interesting is that the dwarf limits are starting to be in tension with the signal. So in the galactic center, we're at this part where if that is dark matter, we might have expected to already see it in the dwarfs. Now they're you know, a factor of a few, the statistical uncertainty on these limits is like a factor of a few. So it's by no means conclusive at this point, but the dwarfs are starting to be in tension with these dark matter interpretations of the galactic center. And with more exposure, things will get better. The other thing that's gonna get, make this better is if we find new dwarfs. Because even, they could be anywhere in the sky. And these wide field of view survey instruments have already observed them, we just didn't know where to look in our data for it. So that's cool, all right. We're seeing new dwarfs. I don't know if Louise told you about this. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's actually really exciting. So we've had a um, 
people have been improving these optical surveys. So the way that you find dwarfs is you look for the couple stars in them, and you look at their velocities, and you say they're whipping around way too fast to not be gravitationally bound by dark matter. And so you need to have very good optical surveys to find these faint clusters of stars. And we have that now with uh, the Dark Energy Survey. And then we'll have it in the future. The upgrade to that will be LSST. They're working on it right now. So you can kind of see these jumps. So this is the total number of dwarf, known dwarf galaxies as a function of year. So you can see in the Sloan era, there was a big jump. And now with the DES era, there's another huge jump. Now with an optical survey, all you can see is that there's some stars, that, there, that there's an overdensity of stars and they tend to be old. So getting the whipping around velocity, that requires spectroscopy, not photometry. So right here, these open circles are things that have photometric evidence suggesting that they're dwarfs, but we haven't measured the kinematics of the stars yet to confirm that they're dwarfs. So the, hopefully the observers are working very hard to fill these circles in. And, but we have found some of the new objects discovered by Dark Energy Survey have been confirmed as dwarfs. And some of them are as good, if not better, than our current dwarfs. One of them in particular I'm very excited about is called um, Triangulum 2. It was actually discovered by PanStars, another optical survey, and that's exciting because it's in Hawke's field of view. Um, a lot of the ones in the Dark Energy Survey have been found are in the southern hemisphere around the large and small Magellanic clouds. Right, so this is a projection of where we expect the dark matter limits from Fermi to be. The black line here is assuming 60 dwarfs. The limits I showed you before had 15. And so we have roughly doubled. Yeah, so I don't think that 60 is terribly optimistic. It's not super out of the, out of the park, especially in the LSST era. Uh, 15 years, for me, we, uh, are already, we were supposed to only be a five-year mission. We've been um, extended through 2018, so that's a 10-year mission. It's a beautiful instrument. Nothing else is at that GEV energy at the sensitivity we are. So I really hope that Fermi can keep flying for 15 years. This dashed line, if there is no dark matter, that's where we expect the limits to be. And if that's the case, then we will be able to say something even more conclusive about the galactic center excess. So right now, they're kind of just in tension. But if we get 60 dwarfs in 15 years, it's going to be more conclusive. So that's an exciting thing. I like that the dwarfs are this nice probe of this uh, dark matter interpretation of the galactic center. And when we find new dwarfs, we get to use the entire Fermi data set because we'd already been looking at them. We just didn't know where to look in the data. So these are the future limits you expect to see from Fermi. These are the five-year expected limits from Hawk that were calculated back in 2014. And so Hawk were expecting to get down you know, to this uh, Summerfeld enhancement cross-section. But this doesn't take into account um, analysis upgrades or if we find a new really dark matter dominated target um, or detector upgrades. So something that we're doing with Hawk right now, we're working on this at Los Alamos, we have the core 300 tanks, but for a 60 TeV event, there's a lot of stuff on the edges here that we're not detecting for the shower. So we're doing this upgrade called Outriggers, which are going to be small tanks, so they're only about person high, and they only have one PMT in them. But they're going to go out and they're going to capture these showers. They're also going to help capture showers where maybe the core is just off the center of the detector. And so what this is going to do is it's going to increase our sensitivity at the highest energy, so about 10 TeV, uh, by a factor of 3 to 4. And what's really exciting is uh, I would love, I, can't, or I guess I can't wait to see Hawk discover the highest energy gamma ray that we've ever seen. So we're shooting after the 100 TeV photon coming from, say, the crab. So like the cost of was only limits, right? Yeah. They didn't actually yeah. Not that high. So I think that's cool. Um, the other cool thing about these, the outriggers for a high, uh, we can probe into higher masses for dark matter. Um, and we can also look for really high energy photons from far, far away sources, which would be evidence for um, axion-like particles. So, but I've got some slides about that. So there's some really cool, um, Astrophysics you can do at these highest energies, but there's also really cool fundamental physics like dark matter you can do. And so I've reached the end. Um, dark matter's there, it's holding our galaxy together. We don't really understand much about it. Uh, I think it's a particle. If it's a particle, its uh, interactions might make gamma rays. And they're a really cool way to study them because they we know where there's a dark matter clump and gamma rays are gonna come back from where they came from. 
So we have two gamma ray instruments. I highlighted Fermi and Hawk, both wide field, a few complementary instruments. Haven't seen a clear dark matter signal yet, but I think the limits that they're setting are very informative, and we've got upgrades coming uh, to both. So the upgrade to Fermi would be finding new dwarfs. Uh, so even though this is uh, a field that's been going on for a couple of years now, you know, I think we're really just starting to scratch the surface. You know, we're really just starting to hit that thermal relic cross-section. Uh, so I think there's a lot more to look forward to. Uh, thank you, and I'll take questions. So it's a 2023. Two question. So the arc, if you had arc, imagine if it's if it were 10 to 20 meters underground, uh, you know, imagine you're in a big space and you're 10 meter overboard and you could stop at all if you were going to showers. Yeah. Uh, not yeah. more than you want and the running showers, and then you could probably put an anti coincidence detector, for example. Is it feasible to imagine that you build a, a like a roof, a few meter high density concrete uh, that would protect you from some ground showers and have some active component? Right, yeah, so you definitely don't want to go underground because um, at that point, so we're at 14,000 feet because lower than that the shower hinders out. Um, so then we would have underground to. Underground meaning relative to that. You just right, right, sure, there. sure. So. I mean, it's that something I was kind of thinking about. Something that I've heard an idea for muon tagging is, since the muons are these straight, straight like penetrating tracks, is to try to maybe do a dual layer tank and look for that track from the muon as opposed to like a shower. Um, that one's probably more feasible than building a big oh it's, yeah than building a big uh, structure. But I haven't heard anyone talking about a structure. Yeah, because you, know, you don't have any points. Exactly. Yeah, and that's hard. But then I don't think the muons themselves are a problem because they would have a different signature. They yeah. know magnetic, so they only mix with your energy right. but the other hydronic showers. Yeah, and there there are people thinking about doing something similar to Hawk in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, we're having a meeting at the end of next week. So I'm curious to see what ideas to improve on the Hawk array come up. So the future of space-based gamma ray astronomy uh, after Fermi is what? Well, there are people working on an MEB instrument, yeah. right? So Compare, for example. Um, but at a GEV, oh, so at a GEV, there are a couple other. Uh, there's a Russian satellite, right? Gamma 400. Right. Um, I'm not sure the status of that one. And there's a Chinese satellite, Pangu, and Dompe. I mean, one is more like AMS, and one is more like Fermi, and I always get them mixed up. Uh, the thing with, I think both of them are going to have a smaller effective area than Fermi, um, but I think that will also be around the GEV region. But it, I think we, if they stop Fermi flying, there's really nothing that I've seen yet that can take its place. Maybe if one, in honor of our uh, Axion uh, speaker here today, maybe you can say a word or two about the Axion limits. Yeah. So, um, Axions, uh, Axions might be all the dark matter, or they might be a small fraction of the dark matter. Uh, there's this thing in the standard model called the strong CP problem. That's a problem that axions are, uh, if you try to solve it with symmetry, you get this new particle called an axion. They couple the uh, photons via magnetic fields. So this is how we can probe them with gamma rays. So something you can do is you can have uh, an axion convert in a magnetic field to a gamma ray, or vice versa. You can also have an axion decay. And so if we look at the conversion probability as a function of uh, gamma ray energy, this is kind of what it looks like. You get this uh, critical energy where you have maximal mixing, but then you get these like instability things here. And what this region would do is in your gamma ray spectrum, you start to get these weird wiggles. So that's something we can look for. Another thing we can look for is high energy particles or high energy photons from objects where the gamma ray should have been attenuated. It should have run into some extragalactic background light and lost its energy. 
And so if it's made it to us, then a way that that can happen is it turned from a gamma ray to an axion in the source, traveled without getting attenuated all the way to the Milky Way, converts back to a gamma ray in the Milky Way's magnetic field, and then we observe that gamma ray. So with Fermi, we haven't seen any of those signals yet. And so the axion base space looks like, at least in the gamma ray world, we have the mass of the axion, and then it's coupling to the you know, electromagnetic sector. This is the QCD axion. So these are the guys that are going to solve that strong CP problem. They have a direct relation between this coupling and the mass. If you make those two parameters independent of each other, you get what we call axion-like particles. They're not as well uh, theoretically motivated, but we still can look for them anyway. So what's cool is with Fermi, we aren't seeing gamma rays from neutron stars. Neutron stars are these really dense nuclear material. You could get axions created through nuclear bremsstrahlung, and then the axion decays. So we would expect to see gamma rays from these guys. Since we don't, we're actually able to rule out this part of the phase space, which is starting to rule out some of the QCD axion. Now, what we're here about in the colloquium is from ADMX, which goes down to here. And so this is a completely complementary uh, probing of phase space relative to, say, the neutron stars. But then we also have up in this corner, uh, you can kind of barely see it, but there's this blue shading where people have claimed to be seeing high energy photons from faraway sources that they shouldn't be. And they think, okay, well, that, must, that might be from axion-like particles. But then here with this big blob that we did with Fermi, we were looking for those spikes, those irregularities in the spectrum in the Perseus cluster. We did not see any, so we were able to rule out a lot of the potential signal base space. And Hess has done a similar analysis and be able to rule it out. And so I'm actually really excited about where Hawk can help with this, especially going up to those highest energies uh, and being able to look for really high energy photons from very distant sources. But so, you see the wiggles you need to have very little background, right? Right. First of all, you need, you need good, good energy resolution. resolution and low background. Yeah, the low background, usually astrophysics stuff tends to be smooth, so what you really, really need is the energy resolution, which a hawk has a pretty poor energy resolution, so the spectral irregularities would be hard with that, but pushing up to those, if you just saw a 100 TeV photon from a like red sort, redshift of a three blazar, that would be completely unexpected without axions. So, uh, we, uh, thank you, we had, um, I think Luger and I were at Sheffield this summer, we heard a couple of, two or three very interesting talks uh, where people were really beginning to push back on the interpretation of the excess and the bulge um, due to dark matter. Uh, the it could also be explained conventionally if these were unresolved uh, like pulsars. And a couple of people have done some very clever analyses that say, look, we can't resolve them, but we can look at the statistics and the graininess of it. Yeah. And it looks look great. Yeah, and I was just wondering, did the momentum continue in that direction that it's more and more excluding the dark matter interpretation? Right, yeah, so people are looking more and more into non-dark matter explanations. And so the millisecond pulsar is uh, pretty popular because the spectral shape works. Um, the low energy spectrum between millisecond pulsar and dark matter, they are different. But like I was saying, the uncertainties there in the spectrum, I think, are too high to be able to tell. So you can do clever things, um, like these papers here. Um, so like uh, Tracy Slatcher and a uh, postdoc Ben Safi um, are people who are working on this, where like you said, you, you, you can tell there's an unresolved point source component because the um, your gamma ray distribution seems to be a bit specklier as opposed to smooth. The dark matter distribution of gamma rays should be smooth in the galactic center, whereas if there are these unresolved point sources, then you might expect them to be more localized. And you can do some clever things Right, so there is still momentum in that direction. I think there's also momentum in just modeling the foregrounds and the backgrounds better. So right now, those foregrounds background modeling, what we use in our analysis is something called Galprop. And so Galprop is cylindrically symmetric. Uh, so it's in these rings. But you know, our galaxy is not cylindrically symmetric with those spiral arms. So there are people working on a 3D code. But what this has to do is you have to take all these gas maps and then you have to take the gas maps, which are integrated along the line of sight, break them up into different distances. That's hard, especially in the galactic center. And then you have to add all those up. You have to figure out where your sources of cosmic rays are, what are their injection spectra, and then put those, once you have all those initial conditions, propagate those cosmic rays inside the entire galaxy over 
you know, millions of years, and then that gives you your final gamma ray map. So it's a hard problem, but there are people working on a 3D version of that, so I'm excited to see what comes out of that. But something that um, I think like people like Tim Linden have been thinking about is in Galprop right now, our cosmic ray sources, if you look at that distribution as a function of radius, it goes to zero at the galactic center, which is probably absolutely wrong. Uh, there are cosmic ray sources in the galactic center, but we just don't, we can't model them, so conservatively, they aren't put in there. But then, if you're not including these sources in the galactic center, then maybe it makes sense that you're not modeling something and you're getting an excess. So it would be nice to get better modeling of the cosmic ray source uh, population more towards the galactic center to put into these propagation codes. So there's a lot of momentum going towards that too, which I think is great. Okay, so let's thank Andrew again. <laughs>